talking today to Simon Norfolk, photographer, who's got a show on at the Crawford Museum and Art Gallery in Cork called Burke and Norfolk. Simon, how did you get started as a photographer? Mm, well, that's 23, 4 years ago. Uh, I started out um, uh, working for left-wing newspapers and magazines, and photographing as a photojournalist, you know, 35mm black and white film, uh, photographing political events and demonstrations and uh, troops out in Northern Ireland and uh, stuff like that for left-wing magazines, hmm. for the political group that I used to belong to. Um, and that's kind of how I started really, since I left college. And then uh, from there I drifted towards photographing the far right and specialising in photographing fascist groups, BMP. And then I moved towards newspapers and magazines. And you group your photographs into two categories, the battle space and technologies. Why are you interested in these two things particularly? Um, well, there, there, it's a pincer movement. There's, there's two ways of talking about the same place really, which is this, you know, the, the military uses this, they used to use this phrase battlefield. But now they realise that what they're working is something which is much more multidimensional, not just that space above the battlefield, the air, air space, mm -hmm. but it's something that goes into outer space, satellite warfare, anti-satellite systems. Uh, but it's something that also continues into cyberspace, information warfare, um, uh, espionage, all, all those kind of systems. It, it's a really multiplex system now, all those fields in which warfare is being fought. And it seems to me that the only thing we're talking about in this era is the um, new and multiple and uh, intricate and murderous ways that warfare is being created and formed and not, not even particularly the battles that, we're, that we can see on the ground now but really also the preparations that are being made technologically for the battlefields of the future. So um, it's, t it's two ways of coming at the same object really. Yeah, and you, you, again in your self-description you, you call yourself a landscape photographer. How does that come together with <laughs> the two things we've just been talking about? Uh, landscape photography is the least worst description that I can think of to just talk about what I do. I mean, I'm not a photojournalist, and I think uh, most people expect that because what I'm interested in is conflict and war, that I am um, therefore a, a photojournalist, war photographer, someone that photographs, mm. you know, men with guns shooting, running and shooting. Sort of Don Don McCullen. Don McCullen, yeah. Tim Page, or uh, Tim Hetherington, perhaps mm. in this era, uh, and um, uh, not interested in that kind of photography at all. I'm much more interested in the the way that the spaces that we live in, uh, the technologies that we use, but really the spaces that we live in are primarily determined by warfare and the technology of warfare. So even a city like London, you know, has a certain shape to the road structure and that's which is mm. still very much uh, inherited from that wall that the Romans built around the city of London. That was at that place where the river cross, the river crossing, was the last place where it was defendable with the technology that they had. If London had been ten miles further upstream, they wouldn't have been able to fire an arrow across it mm. or a spear or something. But the reason why London is where it is is because of that old Roman uh, embedded military technology which was left behind, really. So that idea of our modern society is not being freely formed by international finance or architects or visionaries, or whatever. In actual fact, still being reformed by old bits of crummy leftover military hardware that are still deeply embedded, archaeologically embedded, in the shapes of our cities. And, and indeed the, the grand boulevards of Paris, which were cleared yeah, for so line of sight and fire. Line of sight for artillery fire, yeah. yeah. You know, the shape of a city like uh, Cologne, modern Cologne, is shaped that way not because of Charlemagne or the 13th century, no, it's shaped that way because of the Lancaster bomber. Mm. The Lancaster bomber couldn't pinpoint target a, a ball bearing factory in the middle of nowhere. The only thing you could find at night was a, something the size of a city on a bend in the river that would reflect mm. in the moonlight and could be bombed by a bomber whose idea of accuracy was within five miles. Earlier photographers with a political aesthetic have followed a much grimmer and more propagandist path. I'm thinking people like sort of George Gross or John Hartfield with the guns and butter oh, yeah, photo montage yeah. and in my lifetime Peter Kennard. Yeah. Your own photographs seem to have a luxurious and seductive visual quality that only larger scale colour stills can give, but they all contain poison pills wrapped in this beautiful <laughs> coating. How did you arrive at this approach? That's very nicely put. Um, well, I'm not one of these photographers that's down on photo... I'm not, you know, as someone that makes a living in the art world that thinks sneeringly about photojournalism. On the contrary, I think that my work, uh, uh, you know, it's like one of those remora fish that follows photojournalism around. Um, and, be, and because 
photojournalism, classic war photography, is that hideous, in-your-face, blood splashed up the wall, bolognese on the, floor, on the floor approach to things, then a lot of that idea about beauty and making the picture beauty is, is just a tactical approach, really. It's just somehow, how do, I, how do I penetrate through that carapace that we build around ourselves that says, uh, I've already seen the picture of the dead baby, I've already seen the picture of the feather with the turban fire, I don't need to see a second picture of it. Well, I still want to talk about that that war or that famine, but I can't do it by showing you another picture of a dead baby shot on 35mm. You've seen it, you're bored by it. You know, we live in a, we live in a society where we're kind of drowning in a sort mm. of flow of picture information. So beauty is really just a sort of tactic to sort of make you double stop and like, well, hang on a second, what's that? That's Auschwitz? But I never knew it was that beautiful. And that's all it is. It's just a full stop, pause, draw you in, mm. seduce you into my space so that I can have a conversation with you, which otherwise you would just glide straight past me and off me. And quite often, if you take a picture like the, the one of the North Baghdad Gate that you, you yes. took the picture of, in a sense you're making reference to romantic paintings yeah, of an earlier much, period. Yeah. Yes. And in there, snuck in there, is a little reference. To a rocket launcher or a tank. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> um, uh, uh, very all of that work was very influenced by romantic painting, by Claude Lorraine, Nicola Poussin, because all of those painters were the first people to ever really use ruins as a metaphor in the landscape. And the last 10 years of these 9-11 wars that I've been photographing has been pretty much a kind of journey through rubble and ruins, really, and without me really wanting it to be. And, um, and, and become, quite often uh, without people. a specialist in ruins as well. Yeah, but quite often without people as well. Uh, and people because I don't want my pictures to be kind of biographical about individuals and their individual stories. Uh, other photographers do that much better than me. The classic photojournalists do that better mm. than me. Uh, I don't feel qualified so much to talk about individual stories, nor do I find that particularly interesting because I could tell you 50 stories about a man who was hurt or whatever, and you could find me 50 more about somebody who has done very well out of the American invasion of mm. Afghanistan. What I want to talk about is why is this war taking place? How is this war rooted in their historical continuities about imperialism and the way that capitalism has to work by creating warfare in order to generate the kind of profits that drive along the military industrial complex? So by situating it in that, that's what I want to talk about. I don't mm. want to talk about this is Mohammed and he just lost his wife and his house got bombed. I want to talk about these other issues about empire and imperialism. And Switching subjects, you, you had a bust-up with the UK's heritage conservation charity, the National Trust, over what you called a rights grab mm. as part of a competition. What, what made you so angry with them? Well, I'm a landscape photographer primarily, and um, uh, you know, I sort of see myself as a landscape photographer, and I associate with other landscape photographers, and it seems to me that there was a... And it's, unfortunately, this is something which is just continuing and continuing, but there's a kind of privatisation of all public space in the UK. And the, the bust up with the National Trust was just the first one of these, where basically they just copyrighted their entire landscapes. You know, these people that own mm. huge swathes of the UK, huge swathes of coastline and beaches, and it's not just a bunch of country houses. Um, and I was rather under the impression that they sort of held it on our behalf. Well, actually, they're a private company. Uh, but I kind of thought they were a trust. Mm. I don't know why I thought that, maybe mm. it's because it's half of what their name is. But um, I thought it was held in sort of trust for all of us, and that. Uh, if they deny us uh, photographers the right to take any photographs on their property, then they are blocking off great swathes of our countryside. As it happens, that process is continuing nowadays where most of our public spaces are being found. Olympic parks, mm. plazas between uh, uh, tower blocks, most of the interior of the centre of Liverpool has been mm. privatised, Canary Wall famously so. Uh, the protesters outside the uh, St Paul's Cathedral, for example, discovered that 90% of the property around there is all mm. private property. So um, that idea of uh, our spaces being privatised and handed over to security guards uh, and we've lost all rights of anything that you would consider to be civic. And that was just the thin end of the wedge really, but um, it's just continued apace. And nowadays the idea of walking around, how I learned to take a photograph, by like going out and taking pictures and trying to sell those pictures and not selling them or selling this one. Okay, that's a good one. Do that more. Mm. I can't do that now because great swathes of the countryside have been privatised. Mm. And if you're a kid leaving college, you can't afford 200 quid for a permit, 500 quid for a permit. Mm. I mean, you can't even take a picture in Trafalgar Square, which is meant to be this centrepiece of free speech in this mm. country, this place where some of the world's, some of our countries, our history's greatest speeches have taken place that have formed the politics mm. of what we have, the freedoms that we have. If I take out a, a camera in Trafalgar Square, I get hit with a license for 200 quid. And 
How do you make a living financially as a photographer? Well, not in Trafalgar Square, obviously. <laughs> no, so really, I mean, clearly. Um, well, I'm in a very unique position now because uh, I have sort of multiple... Uh, and I've always wanted to have sort of a, a rather democratic array of outlets for the work. So, you know, at the very top end, I sell prints through art galleries to collectors. Uh, the prints are very expensive, I'm glad to say. And, um, and the prints are limited edition. There's only seven of them. Um, and I get paid quite well for that. But that really just sort of funds me to go and do the other things that I do. So, yes, there's only seven of those prints. Uh, I also produce books, of which, uh, you know, it's sort of like a limited edition artwork mm. in addition to 2,000, really, because mm. the editions are so small on books. Below that, there's a, if you can't afford £7,000 for a print, then you can afford £40 for a book. You can't afford, maybe you can afford you know, £1.50 to see my pictures in the Guardian weekend. If you can't afford that, maybe you can find a way to look at my website. So all of those kind of access points, which are different price points as well in a way, but all of those for me are different kind of access points into the world. So, you know, I would love to have a situation where everybody could own mm. a beautiful art print, but that's just not possible. Uh, but I like the idea that you can come in through many doors into the, world, into the mm. work, and in addition I make a lot of the work in other parts of the world, and it appeals to me a great deal of the idea that an Afghan, can, if they can switch on a computer, can download, download my pictures mm. off my website. The website's very expensive, so I, I steal from Peter to pay Paul, and that's all part of trying to find multiple ways for the work to come out. And I wouldn't really want to cross off any one of those, really, because mm. I like the idea that seven people pay a lot of money to buy a print, but two million people will go and see, buy a copy of the New York Times magazine. Mm. Eight million people will see it on their website. 